All right. We are live. Everyone, as you tune in, welcome to another live recording of the Managing Partners podcast. I am joined with a special guest today, Harry Nelson. Harry, thanks so much for coming on and joining us all the way from L.A. Yeah, my pleasure, Kevin. Thanks for having me on the uh, the Managing Partners podcast. No, absolutely. Look forward to learning more about your practice and uh, and, and how you market your practice and, and all those good things. So uh, I think I was saying before, pre-show, um, <clears throat> I'm less familiar uh, with healthcare law, and so I'm looking forward to learning more. I'm sure others tuning in and watching this in the future are looking forward to it as well. So um, as always, please ask any questions while we're doing this live. Uh, Harry will do his best to answer those questions and uh, so ask away. I'm sure there's a lot of COVID-related questions that might, you know, <laughs> much happy spring to, up. Happy to take whatever questions people have. <laughs> Uh, also, if anyone tuning in, um, I'll add some more stuff in, in the comments. We'll put some links out so you guys can connect with Harry. Uh, if you want to look him up, his handle, uh, I believe this is your uh, this is your Instagram handle. Yeah, uh, I and believe H, so. I'm H Nelson on uh, on LinkedIn, and I'm out there. People can find me. No, just, to be just Google the guy. You can Google him; he's all <laughs> over the place. <laughs> so yeah, check him out, and uh, let's get into it. So. First off, just an introduction. Tell us about yourself a little bit personally. And um, it was kind of cool. I'm in Virginia Beach, Virginia. He's in LA. Uh, he already mentioned that he's, you know, came, he's been to Virginia when he's a, a kid and things like that. So super cool. Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from. And, and I guess, you know, tie that into uh, towards the end of how you started your, your practice. Yeah, I'm happy to. So I, I was born in uh, Brazil. My parents were Americans living down there, but I grew up uh, from from the age five uh, forward. I grew up in Michigan. My my folks are still there. I, I identify as a, a Midwesterner and a Michigander. I went to the University of Michigan. I'm a proud Wolverine for undergrad and law school. Um, I got I got to California. I you know after law school worked in Hawaii for a little while as for a, as a law clerk and then in Chicago. And my wife dragged me out here uh, when our oldest, uh, who's now uh, 20 years old, uh, uh, it was, uh, was a little baby. She wanted to be near her parents. She, she told me uh, if, if we moved to Michigan, I was going to have to, I would be living alone because she'd be in a, uh, in a mental asylum. <laughs> she was not a big, let's just say she wasn't a big fan of the Michigan winters. So we came out to California 20 years ago and, uh, you know, I came out here, I was a ninth year lawyer at that point, And I, uh, I realized I had to, uh, start my own firm. So California and LA played, played heavily in my decision to become a, a lawyer. A managing Excellent. partner. I'm a managing partner, not a lawyer. Sorry, to, uh, to become a, to man become a managing partner and start my own firm and and practice. Uh, well, can you hit on that a little bit? What you know, what kind of uh, encouraged you to do that um, versus you know working in another firm? You know, I, I was at a funny career point. You know, as a lawyer, you're kind of what I found was coming out of law school. I had done well in law school. I had done a judicial clerkship. I was on the law review, so I had done. I had hit all those markers that, as a young lawyer, they tell you to look good. <clears throat> And I and I found I was attractive to law firms at, at us as a as a young lawyer. But then all of a sudden, here I was in this re weird kind of middle career point of like eight nine years out. And I was like, I started looking at what the options would be to go to a big firm, and it just didn't seem that attractive to come in. There were folks who there were going to be a lot of folks my level who had been there much longer and were kind of a lot of established relationships. And and I looked around, I just didn't see a great opening. And so um, I was while I was exploring that, I, I was working with a solo practitioner. And he was, I, I, and I realized that he was in a, in an, an area of healthcare that was so wide open that I could drive a truck through it. There was nobody practicing at a high level doing the kind of work that needed to be done. In a nutshell, like I had been doing institutional work for large health systems and you know university medical centers in Chicago. And I came out here and started working with small doctors practices. And I realized nobody was really giving them the kind of regulatory advice and, and strategy that they needed. So I, I just saw a big opportunity and uh, and that was the beginning. I, I started started there and, and have built ever since in the last 20 years. That's awesome. <clears throat> I mean, it's great when you see that opportunity and you're like, wow, you know, I, I can do something here. That's that's awesome. Uh, you know, it's just like, I think having a focus or a niche um, and just being all in on that. But I, I think it's you got to do the research for anyone, you know, starting a firm in the area you're in is, is, is there a need? Is there a market for it? And, and this, is this the right way to go? 
I, um, yeah, for me, for me, that's the whole thing was like, it was, you know, it, it didn't come like as a flash in the night. It was sort of just the more I worked with these, these, these small practices, the, the more I realized that, you know, they didn't have huge budgets. So they needed somebody who already was smart in their world. And, uh, and, and it, you know, it took a little, and so there, there weren't a ton of people who could do it, but I realized nobody was doing it. And, uh, and even today I look around the, the healthcare world and I see all kinds of spaces where there's just nobody giving people really the kind of on the spot advice that they need at the, at the value point that they need it. And, uh, I just, I just continue to see enormous opportunity. I encourage anybody who's kind of out lawyers out there or young lawyers who are unsure, uh, where there's opportunity. I, first of all, I think it, I think it's in a lot of places, but I think healthcare and life sciences is like remains just a wide open area. Well, like I said in the beginning, um, you know, had a lot of managing partners on this show. Got to interview a lot of awesome people, and I think the healthcare and you know life sciences is something that I've <laughs> I don't know as much about. And again, excited to have you on uh, to talk more about it and learn more about it. But uh, so let me shift over to. You know, you mentioned these practices uh, that that need the help, right? The the smaller uh, medical practices that just aren't getting the attention. Um, you know, what would be some of the challenges that they face, like well, when yeah, they so, come to you? You know, sure. So, like when when it started, I started off giving them a lot of advice. You know, what I was constantly meeting doctors who, uh, you know, did, were, were, would say to me, think they would be primary care doctors, and they'd say. You know, I, 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 my whole, my last, last 20 years, I've been working, I've been making half a million, and these were primary care doctors, three quarters of a million dollars. And all of a sudden, I don't know why, but my, I'm making half or less than half as much as I used to make. And I have to, I have these Medicare's paying me worse. The insurance companies are paying me worse. And what was happening, what I, what I realized just from us, from these various conversations was the economics of healthcare were changing. We were living through a period of innovation, but these people were being left behind. And so I started really advising on strategy of how they joined what was going on out, uh, what was happening out there. Likewise, I had mental health professionals, you know, psychologists uh, complaining to me that they were getting paid, you know, peanuts by large insurance companies. I had psychiatrists complaining to me that their practices had turned to just managing patients on Prozac. And what I started doing was helping them envision where the innovation opportunities were and helping entrepreneurs and people who wanted to find those opportunities pursue them, whether they were in digital health, whether they were in behavioral health, and really identifying where the unmet needs in healthcare were and what the strategies were that would take people there. So that was, for me, the beginning of just really focusing on healthcare innovation, on how our system is transforming, and trying to guide people. And it started with small practices, but then it became a lot of middle market companies. And today, you know, I'm proud to say, like, I, I love middle, I love clients of all sizes, early stage and middle market, but I, I also get hired by large publicly traded companies because everybody needs to be thinking about how the world is changing and how, the, how you find the opportunity and how you seize the opportunity. And so that's defined the last uh, 20 years for me. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, I appreciate that uh, explanation there. And that's just um, so... So when you say like a practice, you're talking about, um, you know, I guess what are some of the types of uh, medical practices? Is so, it everything down to like a, a normal doctor? You know, yeah. What, so, what kind of so, well, so, I, I mean, it's interesting, by the way, that, you know, it started with that. But a lot of a lot of the practices that I started off representing 20 years ago don't exist anymore. Right. That, so we, we <laughs> went if you look back 20 years ago, 80 percent of the doctors in this country were working in a small and solo practice setting. And today. The only doctors working in those kind of settings are specialists, right? So a lot of surgeons. Those that, that model still works. Concierge doctors who pick a, you know, a cash pay niche. Uh, but most of the doctors who I worked for were a lot of them were were just kind of they were dinosaurs. And today they've joined large managed care groups uh, if they haven't retired. And and the practice has really uh, changed dramatically. But so you know what what I so for me it, it was like what happened was I started as I started really understanding the space that my name started getting out there. So for example, um, I started working with a bunch of mental health professionals and pain doctors in particular, you know, areas where people would get in trouble, people would get in trouble with Medicare, people would get in trouble with medical boards, pain, pain medicine from the beginning of my career has been one of the biggest areas. You know, it was like, I came to California in 2001, early days of the opioid crisis and, uh, and, and the medical board, the DEA, you know, insurance companies were going after doctors, uh, and so what? What I what I found was that a lot of these doctors really uh, needed to 
you know, find the opportunities. And so instead of just doing pain work, get involved in addiction. And instead of just working in addiction in a medical office practice, explore outpatient programs and, and residential programs and, and really the full range of um, a, a, a underdeveloped part of our landscape. So I, you know, for me, the practice really, my practice, I sort of, I feel like I, I, I traveled with my clients from, from where we, from where they started, to, uh, to the places where the opportunities, the growth opportunities were, um, and a lot of that was, so a lot of that was in behavioral health for me, a lot in digital health, right, telehealth, helping. I'm, I'm proud to have had a chance to work with. Uh, and help build some of the largest telehealth ventures in the country, um, and and into cannabis. Uh, these days, like lately, it's been people heading into psychedelics and really trying to be on the forefront of advising doctors on whatever the emerging issues are. Is it stem cells? Is it peptides? Is it is it some new therapy? Is it artificial intelligence? Uh, genomic testing? You know, wherever wherever the opportunity is. You know, my belief is uh, uh, people need to go, and sometimes it's driven by science and therapy. Sometimes it's driven by by by, by patient demand. Uh, but our system is changing, and so I always try to be, you know, where my be with my clients in the center point of the change. Yeah, I mean, lots of different changes, uh, and, and lots more things happening, uh, laws changing, and and things coming on the market. So uh, yeah, it sounds like a, a constant kind of battle to get navigate through that. Um, and it sounds like you said before, like some of your older clients, sounds like you help them retire. And yeah, I, I think, I think look, there, there are a lot of people, honestly, in the, uh, you know, my experience of the early two thousands was like that. And then also the affordable care act did the same thing, right? I think a lot of doctors, uh, either some retired and some just, you know, realized they, they were done with being in an insurance based practice. You know, I have a lot of clients who, who moved to concierge models, to functional medicine, to figuring out, you know, a way that they could have the practice and the life that they want. And, uh, and, and medicine changed profoundly, right? The days there, I, I have a, a good friend who's a uh, urologist and uh, his father, his father was a urologist who earned in the, you know, greater California was earning close to a million dollars a year in private practice by himself. And he, when he graduated fellowship in the same specialty, he realized it wasn't going to be the same thing. He was much better off to go to Kaiser. He was going to earn a, a third of what his father earned, but he was going to have a nine to five job. He was going to have a, a lot of quality of life. And those are valid choices, right? So I try to work with doctors wherever they are. Some of them are going to make that choice. Some of them are going to, you know, and it's not always doctors. Sometimes it's just entrepreneurs who want to, who, who know how to, who see a better way to deliver care and meet patient needs. And uh, sometimes it means aiming, you know, I had a client who sold for a, a billion dollars uh, three years after they started in, in, in dental, uh, teledentistry and dental appliances. And then you have clients who, uh, wow. who are really looking just to build a, 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 a life, you know, a high quality of life uh, that will allow them to be with their families, their partners. And, uh, you know, it, it, as a lawyer, my, I feel like my job is just to help people navigate to go from point A to point B. And wherever and they they have to decide what that is. <laughs> well, it, it just sounds like a really cool space to be in. Honestly, just listening to you. Uh, versus... I, I have fun with it. Yeah, it's a little bit. Of, it can be a tight. It can be a tightrope uh, walk sometimes in being in innovation spaces because you're you're dealing with late changing laws and and trying to read the tea leaves on how government agencies are going to respond. But um, I I love this practice and I uh, it's been it's been deeply rewarding and 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 uh, yeah, it's 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 never boring. <laughs> I bet. Um, well, all right. Different question. So, uh, what are some of the mistakes, maybe, that you know? You say you engage with a new client. You're trying to figure out what they're doing, how what help they need. Uh, what are some of the mistakes, maybe, they make prior to talking to a professional like yourself? And maybe this you is know, smaller think, practices. But. Yeah, I think. I think. Um, look, I think. Uh, it's a tricky market out there. I, I, on, in, in contrast, being somebody who works with doctors, I'm always impressed that, you know, doctors complain about how all the board certification and the specialty work that they have to go through to demonstrate their specialties. I, honestly, I think we would benefit uh, uh, from having more of that in law. I think it's very hard for clients to figure out uh, uh, who they should be working with and what they really need to do. And I think, I think too often clients sort of 
don't get good strategic advice early on, don't work with the right person. I, I, I end up with a lot of folks who started off working with a big law firm um, and they're a great, I have, I compete with a lot of these big national firms in their healthcare groups and there are great lawyers there, but, but they're not, they're not built, you, you know, for, to work with those clients. So clients need to know what they want. And likewise, I'm not the right lawyer for everybody. God knows, like I, you know, I'm a lawyer for, for people who are really looking to innovate and be entrepreneurial, but I'm not necessarily built for, uh, you know, I, I'll get on the phone sometimes in a deal where it'll be me on one side of the phone for one client and on the other side, the company that wants to buy them, there'll be 15 lawyers on the phone. And so you, you gotta, as a client, you gotta know what, you're, what you're gonna know what you're looking for and you, and you got to know not just like the the specialty of law but the mindset of the lawyer like there are lawyers who are great at saying no right I sometimes I'm jealous I, these lawyers at big firms they work for large institutions and there's a general counsel reporting to a CEO reporting to a board and the answer is going to be no 99 times out of 100 and as long as everybody stays out of trouble that lawyer did a great job I don't I don't work in that world right I work in the world of people who want want to want to know how to do things and so as a client you got to make sure you're working with your kind of lawyer uh, who's going to get you where you need to go you got to have very upfront conversations about what's going to be involved uh, and 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 what the how many people how many lawyers are going to be involved how much it's going to cost uh, and uh, we don't make it easy with the billable hour uh, for clients to get transparency and so I think uh, those are the places where I see clients getting into uh, getting frustrated getting into problems and, and definitely areas where where we, we could definitely do better as a profession <clears throat> gotcha all right well you you've mentioned clients a couple times <clears throat> I, I kind of mentioned in the beginning like you, you guys have really good PR I've seen you on a ton of interviews and and things like that and you, you've written a couple books which we'll talk about here in a few minutes um, but how do you get clients so <clears throat> now maybe this is different when you started like when you just started your new firm what did you do yeah. did you pound you know, I, the streets and, and then never, versus like today yeah. So I would say at the early days, you know, I, I was ben I benefited from having a handful of clients who were evangelical about my practice. There was one doctor I worked with. He was a doctor doing infusion therapies. Uh, there's a therapy called um, in intravenous immunoglobulin. And he was very worried. He had been doing it for years. Medicare came to him and said, we think you're, you're using it in medically unnecessary cases. And he was he was worried. And, and they, Medicare wanted a, a million and a half dollars back from him. And uh, and he was worried. I was a junior lawyer at that point, you know, in his in his eyes. And I did this case. And at the end of the case, he owed the government back like one hundred and fifty dollars. Like they, I, I, I got nine. I got a mil, one like one one point four uh, million nine hundred thousand uh, uh, nine ninety thousand removed from the judgment. And I had the judge actually crying at the, the pain that his, that these people were suffering and how much he was helping them. And so he, I had client, he was an example of a client who became evangelical and started telling everybody in his network, you got to be working with Harry. So I was definitely a beneficiary of a lot of those people. I, I, I have to say, like, I, I'm grateful to a number of senior colleagues at other law firms who started working with me, you know, m who met me and, and, and saw, thought that I could add something to their cases and brought me in from other, some of the other uh, bigger firms in LA. Um, and, I, and then, and what I sort of focused on myself was, was networking and making sure that all the lawyers out there, the business lawyers in the LA community in Southern California knew who I was and knew that I could help them with their clients. Uh, and I also started trying to do provocative thought leadership. So I, I kind of see it as really a two, you know, there were two issues. One was sort of carving out some space and making, uh, making, let, letting people know that I was thinking hard about, you know, the future of, of kind of emerging issues in healthcare um, with some like blogging, for example, and writing. And at the same time, just building a network of people who knew me and who felt comfortable introducing me to their clients. So, you know, what's happened is I've, I've become kind of the, uh, for lack of a better word, the 800 pound gorilla of a certain strata of, 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 of Southern California where you know, there's a pretty good chance you're going to hear my name if you're doing a certain kind of healthcare and life sciences work. And so, you know, I still like the, the, the it's a very different way of marketing uh, than than the big law firms. And and so I get the television networks calling me, you know, and 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 putting me on TV and, and giving me a lot of awareness, which keeps that network active. Right. A lot of the game as a lawyer is just occupying uh, a little bit of mental space so that when people see a certain situation, you know, whether it's a, a health data privacy breach or whether it's a, an overdose death, they, 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 somebody in their network needs help and they say, you know what, I have the right guy for you to call. So that, that's how uh, I would say that's been the core, 
that's been my core approach. Over time, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who do law firm marketing who tell me, and I think they're right, that I don't do enough outbound, you know, business development work that the bigger firms that I compete with are, are much better at kind of knocking on doors and sending out, you know, do, doing really trying to get in front of people. Um, but I, I've been blessed to have a massive amount of inbound traffic. Uh, every day I, I get at least three or four calls. Um, they don't all necessarily become clients. Sometimes they're just helping people and giving a little bit of advice. But um, I stay real. That's how I stay really busy. <clears throat> I love it. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's really how I built my company originally is is networks and meeting people and being out in the community and meeting business owners and competitors and, and really just got out to, to know people. So um, definitely a great way to build. And again, I saw <clears throat> well, yeah, you're featured on on media, you're getting PR. So, you know, you just sounds like you're doing a great job there. You're on the Managing Partners podcast. I mean, this is huge, right? So <laughs> great. I know I'm excited. I always excited to, uh, first of all, I find it's a learning process for me just to meet people like you, Kevin, and just to have a chance to share ideas. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, anyway, no, I'm grateful for these opportunities. But yeah, it, the, 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 the visibility <laughs> I definitely have found is, is important, particularly I found in the pandemic, it was enormously helpful because you, there wasn't as much networking opportunity. And so, you know, having opportunities, whether it was podcasts, whether it was being on TV, was a really good way to to just be able to stay in contact with people and, 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 and occupy some, take a little, you know, make a mental impression that keeps people thinking of me. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Uh, January, <clears throat> January, like uh, the first week or so, I, I came out with like my, my goals for the year and um, some are business related. Most are actually, cause I run a business, but uh, business related things. And, and so I was like, Oh, I want to, I want to speak at like, you know, in-person events, like 12, I want 12 speaking engagements this year. Well, you know, I talk about marketing and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, or business entrepreneurship. That's another big thing for me. Um, and of course, you know, a couple weeks into the year, you know, COVID happened. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to still try to do this, but I'm going to do it, you know, on Facebook live or I'm going to be on webinars or, or whatever. So uh, I still kept the goal, just had to kind of switch gears on how I was going to do that. So definitely a little bit different with, with COVID and, and, um, but I, I think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's forced some businesses, definitely law firms and courts into, you know, about 10 years ahead, pretty much oh, yeah. every night. <laughs> so. you know, the, the, the craziest thing for me was I, I, you know, we, we had the same experience. I, you know, it was, it was a, well, a lot of scrambling and figuring out what we were going to do. You know, I, I panicked at the beginning. I'm a, I'm a, wor a constant worrier, professional worrier. And, uh, so I, I panicked at the beginning. Wait, my grandma <laughs> uh, I, at, at the beginning of the pandemic. And so I, I, I reached out to some of my networks and I said, hey, I'd love to talk to uh, addiction treatment providers. Uh, I'd, love to, uh, I'd love to eating disorder programs to autism providers about how to survive in the pandemic, how to move to telehealth. And you know what I found was um, I found that normally I, I normally I'd be happy to do a webinar and I'd get like 100 people online and I'd say that's great. I was getting literally 1500 people on at least wow. on each of these things and and you and, and and you really I felt the pandemic was an enormous opportunity to like show people uh, that you could be of value to them and and not just to make it about trying to generate work but really trying to help people and I, I really feel like there was a lot of goodwill that have, uh, you know, from that work that has, I still see it today. I have people reach out to me and they say, you know, I saw you, it was in the early days of the pandemic. I saw that program you did on eating disorders and it was, um, it, it's, it was a big deal. I, I, uh, I'm really, uh, I feel like those moments kind of test you a little bit, but they, they end up paying enormous, enormous rewards as people, uh, you know, under, as people see, uh, um, sorry, I got a little, Phone call. Sorry about that. Right, Adam, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, um, but but anyway, I, it, it was just an enormously uh, uh, powerful time to be to really test, you know, what we were, uh, what you know, what 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 we what we could do to help people. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you saw uh, we saw tons of 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 those things happening, and uh, you know, I know for us with our clients, we immediately reached out to every client. Uh, to see how we could be assistance and help with anything. We cut invoices in half. We, you know, we did a lot of things, um, especially for, you know, at the time we had quite a few retail type clients that were affected immediately. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good things that happened. And we we're just fortunate enough that uh, we were fairly a remote company as capability wise. We had an office 
physical here in Virginia with about maybe six to eight of us. Um, I have employees that think about five different states. So wow. this video and all that stuff was, is pretty common. We had huddles every day on video before that, but, um, but not, you know, everyone else wasn't so fortunate. So, but, uh, yeah, a lot of good things came out of it. Um, you know, in the wake of it. Um, and, uh, that's good. You guys could, yeah, that you could do that and, and help people out and, and you're, you know, get some, some reward out of it as well at the end. So no, it's a, yeah, it's a chance. Look, those moments are when people are paying attention and people need help are moments to, to demonstrate leadership by, in my world, by sharing expertise with people and giving people the pathway uh, to, to do the things they need to do. And I, I never would have thought of uh, like an eating disorder or those things, you know, being a, you know, a, an issue, which makes sense. You oh just said. It was yeah. terrible. I, we're dealing. I'm. I'm actually working on a new book right now uh, uh, called uh, "After the Virus," talking about the the pandemic, the, the overdose crisis, and the mental health crisis in America. You know, after this this pandemic, uh, it's at new levels. It's really uh, it's really disturbing. I mean, I've seen it in, in my own my personal life with uh, close friends uh, dealing with young kids uh, um, struggling with anxiety, with eating disorders, and and very much uh, exacerbated by the by the pandemic. I can only imagine. So new book coming out. Um, well, speaking of which we, I was going to ask you about your one book, but we have, uh, Sean, we have a question in here from YouTube, uh, Sean Ragsdale. All right. Will you be making a follow-up book? I, from- <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate the question. I am. I thanks for, thanks Sean for the question. I, I am, I'm working actively right now on a, on a, a book. Uh, there's a, a an organization called project opioid that I connected with down in Florida who um, asked me to um, collaborate, and and it will be, in some ways, a follow up to both books, um, particularly uh, uh, the, the the second book. You know, I, I, the the uh, the opioid book. I I I feel like a, a lot of the message that we tried to get that I tried to get across uh, in in the second book, um, in the opioid book, was really about the need to for us to take really take action at, uh, on a on a community wide basis and look for opportunities for partnership with the business community, with the faith communities, um, and not just look only to healthcare and government to, to address the crisis. So I'm excited. I'm excited about that book. We're still, the, the research is still coming in. So we're, we're uh, probably working on it for a few more months, but it's com- it's shaping up really nicely. On the uh, Obamacare, you know, I, people ask me, was I going to write a Biden care book? So uh, <laughs> it's interesting to me, Biden care looks like Obamacare part two, um, but uh, I'm not sure that there's quite as much to say. I, you know, the whole, the genesis of that first book was, I had clients calling me uh, panicked about what was going to happen. Cause a lot of, in healthcare, a lot of people made big bets based on uh, the Affordable Care Act and based on Obamacare. Uh, and uh, I, people sometimes don't like the names uh, uh, Obamacare, but I, 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 it's just what everybody called it. So, um, so I, you know, my, my goal in writing that first book was to kind of calm people down and say, here's what you need to be focusing on. The, the Democrats don't have all the answers on health care. The, the Affordable Care Act had some ideas that worked, some ideas that failed. Um, the Republicans have some ideas that make sense, some ideas that uh, 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 that don't, and 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 the answers in healthcare are going to be. It's I, I my my main goal was to tell people to worry less about government policy and more to focus on what was driving and really transforming healthcare. Um, I would love to get back and write more of a sequel to that one, but uh, I think it's going to have to wait for because the, the the overdose mental health issue is just very much on my mind, and uh, and just in in all candor, part of the reason I wrote the books was not just to put legal ideas out there, but it was also, uh, for me, I, I felt like, you know, I, I, I do very well and I feel very grateful for the blessings of serving clients, but I also felt like an obligation to put ideas out there and try to make a social impact um, in doing so. So so I, so I, I feel like the mental health overdose uh, uh, crises are, they need immediate attention um, and uh, hopefully we'll come back to Biden care uh, or whatever follows it, uh, uh, post-COVID care later. Post-COVID care. <laughs> well, Sean said, well, that answers question number one. And actually, Sean asked two questions. Second question, are you seeing a trend in remote health monitoring? Yeah. No, it's a great question. Uh, we're, it's a huge uh, opportunity. Yeah, remote patient monitoring has become a big thing. The government insurance is paying for it. Medicare is paying for it. We're seeing a lot of interest 
um, and uh, a lot of opportunities. Um, I think it's a game changer. You know, I mean, it, the bottom line is if you really study healthcare costs, enorm an enormous pro uh, proportion of our costs are these catastrophic events that were avoidable. If you, right, if you were monitoring a patient, you could prevent the heart attack or the stroke and just see that the warning signs were building and get them to the doctor, get a, get a medication prescribed you know, before the stroke. Uh, before the heart attack, my God, we could save literally, I mean, the, the savings are astronomical. So remote patient monitoring is definitely making a huge, uh, it's going through a huge growth uh, spurt. And I think it's going to be sustained. I, I think it's really exciting, actually. You know, I, I think the future is going to be a really almost global uh, remote patient health, remote patient monitoring, not just for the sickest patients, but for more and more people. I think, you know, those Fitbits and Apple watches that people watch, right at this yeah. point, they're still, they're no one, people say, oh, the data's not that great. You know, it's like, uh, you're, you're not really, it's not really useful for healthcare. I, I think my prediction for 10 years from now is that data is going to be super relevant and you're going to it's going to you're going to start getting your your fitbit or your apple watch giving you a warning and say hey your blood pressure is concerning you know you ought to, you got to get to the doctor and i think so i think uh i think it's an important trend in improving health and in reducing healthcare costs that's a good point up next we have harry nelson's stock picks for uh <laughs> <laughs> health monitoring <laughs> that is no, it's going to only get better and only surge, I think. And I, I think you're right. I think uh, the big players um, are going to make that data better and and make it more of a uh, just a common thing that you have available to you. I think you know? it's um, no, it's so important. I mean, I, I think we we often lose sight of how much healthcare costs, how much savings and improved health there would be if we just caught things early. And uh, we're living through a transformation in the kind of personal health data that we can capture and, and then and, and actually operationalize. So to me, I, I, it's, a, it's super exciting. And uh, I just think we're, we're a couple of years away yet from it really being, I've had people tell me um, at, at one of the big local hospitals in LA, they will actually let you put your data into the system, but they don't actually use it to monitor your health. So for example, if you're a, a patient on chemotherapy, uh, at some of the big LA health systems, you can put your Apple data or Fitbit data in, but they're only doing it just to make sure that you're still walking around and you're still active. They're not actually saying, oh, you know, relying on the, on blood pressure or pulse data, you know, cardiopulmonary vitals. But I, I think that's going to change. The, the technology is just needs to get a little a little better, a little cheaper. And uh, uh, I, I've got I wouldn't bet against uh, technology. Yeah, I, I wouldn't either. I think that'll that'll be. I mean, yeah, like you said, five or 10 years, I think for sure, as it gets better, that, you know, they're going to start monitoring, they can use that stuff to monitor uh, patients that are, you know, coming out or ones that have, you know, you know, high risk. Um, and that's going to become more common to where, you know, you or me says, hey, I, I want that. I want to pay for whatever that cost is. I'm sure there'll be some cost, um, but I think it'll be uh, available to the general public at some point for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then you got you know privacy concerns and HIPAA compliance and all that stuff. You know, I don't know uh, how that all goes down, but you know, it's uh, you know, look, yeah, <laughs> that's a big conversation. I feel like we've yeah. kind of sold ourselves our privacy out to a large extent. I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I've, done. <laughs> I think it's already like privacy was a, is a that's so two thousands. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, what's that? I don't know. I got there's ring cameras all outside my house. I got my neighbors have them. Like who knows. I'm probably it's, on 20 uh, cameras just getting out of my neighborhood. So, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Uh, no, it's an interesting question. How much are we going to see a resurgence of privacy? You know, I, we're dealing with a lot of these. The California Consumer Privacy Act has been a kind of mm -hmm. a scaring a lot of healthcare, big healthcare companies, and uh, um, you know, we're we're definitely going to see. We're seeing a little bit of a revolt, but the reality is, I think uh, that I think we've we've lost the battle. <laughs> the yes, so there was. <laughs> So uh, everybody knows everything about you. It's it's not. I mean, it's not quite that bad, but it's very interesting. You know, for, I'll just give you one fascinating example. I have a client doing genomic testing, and they said, "Well, we're going to be able to predict the cancer risks for uh, for people, but what if the life insurance companies get hold of that? Right? Like, what if uh, what if the uh, it, you know if they're if you're, are these people going to lose life insurance because they did a genomic test? So I think there are actually some very serious questions. It's just that uh, you know. Hmm. I, 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 you know, I, it's funny, like you can see, I, I, I'm a good example. You know, I go online and I research, I'll, I'll be de dealing with a client in a particular healthcare specialty. So the other, the other uh, couple months ago, I had a client who was focusing on solutions for menopausal women. And I started Googling that. And sure enough, everywhere I go, 
I'm getting ads for, <laughs> for products for menopausal and services for menopausal women. And so uh, it's like you, uh, I, I, I definitely just as by virtue of being uh, somebody who has to do a lot of research on what's uh, trending in different areas, <laughs> you see how much people are, are not paying attention to who you are, but paying everything, all, all this attention to what you're looking at. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we do that for our clients, right? If someone was looking for a healthcare uh, lawyer like yourself, we could show them ads and show them all kinds of stuff for your firm all over the place, right? Um, and so, <clears throat> but you also have to be smart about how you use it because uh, in your case, you weren't interested in that at all. And now you're getting all this stuff, right? So they didn't have, they're not using a lot of information. They're just using the fact that you were on a site and then now you're tagged and now you're just going to be shown that information. So they're, they're spending right. money to advertise to really the wrong person. Uh, or if you can layer that on with like other data, like you're not a woman, right? So, uh, <laughs> so just right. things like, yeah, age, other things you can get, you know, layer data on, then they could, you know, spend a little bit more uh, wisely, but you know, that's just on the advertising side. But, um, but yeah, everything you do now, um, even if you just mention a product, you'll see it in some cases. I've seen yeah. it happen over and over again. So that's pretty impressive what they could do. So um, I don't think we have any other questions that come in. Hold on. I see another one. We got, uh, we got Sean again. He's coming back with another question here for you. No, it's a great question. Sean, Sean, you've had all these, uh, these great questions. GDPR. So yeah, so GDPR for anybody who's, uh, the question is, is it moving closer to home? Also insurance having access to genome. Is that like Uma Thurman? Is that like Attica? Yeah. So I, I so, so the first question, you know, if you had, if you weren't paying attention to the California consumer privacy act, it was, uh, it was ad adopted two years ago. It, it actually was expanded a little bit this past year. And it is uh, basically, it's, it's the equivalent, it is the US equivalent of this new privacy standard from Europe, the GDPR. So GDPR is, is a pretty radical um, in increase on privacy protection from the US, right? You, you can order, you can basically demand that people lose, you know, stop recording your information, erase it from their systems. It gives consumers an, significantly more rights. And so California has been the first state to go that way, although they limited its, uh, its impact to larger companies based on revenues. Uh, and so it's not yet fully effective and it's only in California. Uh, so what we're going to see, I believe, is, is more and more states are going to do uh, the, you know, it's the law is basically popular with consumers. So I, I expect that we'll see a spread of GDPR type standards like the CCPA in California uh, spreading around the country. Um, certainly in, in blue states, I think that's going to be a, a, a trend I would predict. Uh, and so your, your question on the, on the access to the genome, I get, by the way, Gattaca is one of my favorite movies. I love that movie. So Sean, good movie taste. Um, uh, and so Gattaca is such a great, a great uh, uh, and scary idea of, of a future where your, your, your opportunities are defined by your, by your genes. And the worst thing at that point you can be is born uh, just of an ordinary, uh, you know, union that wasn't like genetically planned in advance. And um, I do think that we are, uh, you know, we, we're on the verge of a number of, of kind of scary genetic choices that parents can make. Um, as a religious, as a person of faith, I, I, have, I have deep questions about those kind of uh, interferences. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that we are really struggling with, uh, with what the, what the rights you know, with what individual rights are and what and what rights parents have to predetermine the intelligence of their children, the um, you know the appearance of their children, all all, all of these health issues um, in ways that, like, when you look at the CRISPR technology that we have, it, it, the implications are are really staggering, and we don't have enough law to stop it. Um, so, so are we going to see? I think we're still probably a, a, away from the kind of. Uh, uh, sort of dystopian future predicted by Gattaca, but I do think these issues are, in all seriousness, creeping up. And I think we, as a society, have to make choices. And it's very difficult because we have, we have, we have people, we have very different value sets. Um, you know, a very polarized population that's going to have to navigate some hard questions about how far these technology goes. I think most people would be, you know, happy to learn that you could plan, you could, you could, you know, determine uh, and av and avoid like terrible genetic diseases, for example. Uh, but how far we go in letting people actually, you know, decide uh, exactly what uh, gender, what what appearance, what height, you know, they want their child to have is a uh, is a is a little to me. It's a little uh, uh, disturbing, and and I think it's uh, 
I think it, the, the fact that we're, it, it forces upon us a question, we have the technology, but do we, what is our responsibility to limit the, uh, its usage to, um, out of a fundamental respect for certain values that we, we hold dear? Yeah, very good question from Sean. Um, good response to that too. And yeah, that is kind of disturbing, kind of scary to think about um, and, you know, where it can go, right? And, um, but what, what was that movie, like 96, 97, something like that? I thought it was a little earlier, but you might be right. I, um, I, it's definitely 90s, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I got to go back and watch it again. I love that movie. But, but, but I do think it raises a question that I think we should all be asking ourselves all the time, which is, okay, so I can do this. But should I do this, right? Like, so that to me is like a question that I don't think we ask ourselves enough. Like, we live in a time when we have so many options available to us. We can lead, lead these incredibly hedonistic lives. But I would do a lot better. Like, uh, you know, if I didn't come home and say, like, I, I could eat that, uh, you know, that that, <laughs> that that dessert my wife made. But but should I? Like, I would be I would be better if I asked myself that question more. <laughs> yeah, I think we all would be. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> That's funny. Well, man, I really appreciate you coming on with us. And, and Sean, thanks for the great questions there. Um, everyone else watching, this is going to be a lot up on YouTube, on LinkedIn. We're going to have it up on our website. And we'll be sharing it out quite a bit too. Um, anything else you want to share? I know you got the, the new book coming out. Um, I'm going to put the link to your, um, your other books in the comments here. And then I will share a couple of ways people can connect with you here in a second as well. But What's next for Harry Nelson? I'm, uh, you know, I'm just trying to, uh, to, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what the next phase is going to be like. I feel like surviving and thriving in the pandemic was one set of challenges, but, you know, looking, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time looking at how our workforce is changed, how our clients are changed, how the needs of patients are changed by this time and how we how we move forward and i and i'm somebody who believes like it's not we're not going back to the way things were i'm seeing on every level uh you know we we the, the pandemic has made radical changes and i just think we need to embrace them and figure out how we can make a difference with them so um i know a lot of people out there i i i i, I incur, i am encountering a lot of people who are very worried about like where things are going, you know, is the stock market going to crash? Are we, are we, uh, are we, are you know, is are people never coming back to work? Like, uh, you know, uh, is, and and I think like I just think, you know, I think that life is constantly presenting us with challenges and asking us to change to meet those challenges. And I certainly think that that's true for lawyers and for people managing or managing their own firms. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I'd love to be in dialogue with anybody who's. Uh, who wants to talk about those ideas? I think it's. I think we're 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 definitely living in a in an interesting time, but I also think it's exciting. Well, you know, <clears throat> I think with challenges and change comes opportunity. You know, so uh, whether that's you know it depends on how your mindset is. Okay, there's a there's a this is a challenge. There's a problem. There's people that need to help solve those issues or battle that challenge. So there there's opportunity surrounding all that. Um, it's going to be hard and struggle for some people. It's, it's going to be a bad situation for others. Um, and I think some people are going to come out ahead because of whatever opportunity they saw in, in the issue um, at hand. So, uh, but I think what you're doing is, is, is awesome. You're putting out great content. You're helping people <clears throat> with, with the books you're putting out and um, with just, you know, sharing your knowledge. Uh, I think it's great. So, you know, connect with Harry, go check out his website. It's uh uh, it's Nelson, uh, what? Nelson Hardeman.com. Hardeman.com. Um, you can check him out, find him on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we just connected on LinkedIn. So, uh, check him out there and, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to, like I said, have dialogue with you, chat with you, answer any questions you have. And of course, if you need his help, you know, reach out to him and his firm and I'm sure they can help you out. So, uh, Harry, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation and, uh, just look forward to uh, having your episode up on the website here soon. No, thanks for having me on, Kevin. Really a pleasure to be with you. A great, great, uh, great chance to, to, to talk. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. Absolutely. All the managing partners watching, make sure you learn, uh, you know, a couple of these things from Harry. And if you need any marketing assistance, reach out to us, ArrayLaw.com. We'll help you out. And uh, so you can be a rock star like Harry here. So... <laughs> Uh, for everyone watching, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon.